Before we begin, I want to say something. This, in my opinion, is quite possibly the most dangerous thing I could do on this channel. It's not that what I'm doing here is wrong. It's not that what I'm saying here is untrue. And it's not that this video is even all that interesting or exciting. It is my personal opinion through countless litigation documents that I have read that Behringer, and remember, this is my opinion, that Behringer abuses the legal system to silence criticism. I don't think it is ever stupid to share your opinion about something or someone, especially if you think that something or someone's doing something wrong. Anything I say here is my opinion and my fair personal interpretation of Behringer's public behavior and communication. For the record, I have very little to gain from making this video, and the moment I press that upload button, I will lose any future support from a massive, gigantic conglomerate in the music gear industry. The reason I'm saying the name Behringer right now, and the reason I'm going to use the name Behringer as much as possible in this video instead of Music Tribe, or previously called Music Group, is because Behringer is Uli Behringer's brand, and Music Tribe is Uli Behringer's holding company. And that holding company has a lot of different brands like TC Electronic, Midas, and so on. To my knowledge, Music Tribe is pretty hands-off with the companies that they acquire. For example, the Annie's Homegrown brand was acquired by General Mills. But General Mills understands the concept of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So Annie's Homegrown continues to make locally sourced organic peace noodles or whatever they do. When most musicians think of Behringer, they think cheap. And when most electronic musicians think of Behringer, there's quite a bit of a negative vibe, isn't there? We think of it as kind of this lame German company that clones old classic analog synthesizers. And since they're not actually putting any money into R&D or inventing anything original, they can sell it for a fraction of the price. I personally not only believe that Behringer wants you to see them this way, I think that their business model requires you to see them this way. Like this thing is indirectly marketed as a TB303 clone. It isn't a TB303 clone. At face value, it looks and sounds like a TB303, but you can make a reactor patch sound like a 303. I can make a modular patch sound like a 303. I probably have 20 different synths in this very room that can sound like a TB303. The same can be said for the Behringer Model D or the Wasp or so on. They're not identical clones, and they're really no closer in sound or functionality than what an iPad app can achieve trying to do the same thing. And if you, the consumer, support Behringer and buy something like this, then good, they're a lot of fun. I hope you make awesome music with it. I could think of a lot worse ways to spend a few hundred bucks. But this weird online ethical controversy of Behringer cloning the circuits of vintage synthesizers is absolute nonsense. And in my opinion, I think that Behringer benefits from it a whole lot. Here's a piece of gear that you may have never really paid all that much attention to because it just simply tells you if cables work or not. Now I've bought quite a few of these and brought them on tour because they do make sound checks quite a lot more tolerable and I never even considered buying another brand's cable tester because Behringer was affordable for something where I didn't really care if the quality was top notch or not. It wasn't until I read through a defamation lawsuit filed by Behringer when I found out that this thing existed, the Ebtech Swiss Army cable tester. Now, despite what you may think you see with your two eyes and your sentient brain that's capable of identifying two things that look alike, I'm not going to imply anything because the only reason I know about this EBTEC cable tester is because Behringer sued DSI because an employee pointed out the exact thing that's going through your f***ing brain right now when you look at the two of them. And the DSI employee did not say this in any official capacity. He said it on the Gear Sluts forum in an internet debate with Behringer. That's right, if you appear to defeat Behringer in a debate on Gearsluts.com, you may either receive a gag order or a lawsuit in excess of $250,000 for pointing something out that nobody with f***ing eyeballs would disagree with. And for the sake of keeping this video under a week long, we are only going to be talking about the DSI employee and not the many other forum users who received legal threats from Behringer for, I don't know, making Uli Behringer's pee-pee hurt. So long story short, Behringer filed suit in the California court system, had to waste their time going through pages and pages and pages of a gear sluts flame war before finally deciding that the whole thing was stupid. And I guess more formally, they decided that it was a strategic lawsuit against public participation. 
or otherwise known as SLAP. SLAP laws are great, by the way, and there's no way in hell I'd be making this video if I lived in a state that didn't have very good ones. Naturally, DSI countersued for six figures, and at this point, I wish that Dave Smith and Uli Berenger would just have an MMA match for charity and be done with this whole thing. Peter Kern is an old peer of mine, and he runs the incredibly useful music blog, Create Digital Music, or CDM. He didn't go on a tirade, he wasn't overly opinionated, he did his job and reported on music tech news. Peter occasionally reported and commented on Behringer's very real and very public lawsuits, and DSI is not the only one. Behringer threatened to sue MidiFan, which is a Chinese music blog, because MidiFan called them copycats. Peter reported on Behringer registering the trademark of Monopoly, or Monopoly, assumingly for their upcoming release of a clone of an old Korg synth of the same name. Behringer, just being the absolute mad lads that they are, decided to trademark Kern, Peter's last name, and then went on to brag about it on social media. Now we also took a heavy ass bar of gold and took a crayon and wrote Peter on it and then chucked it into the Pacific Ocean. Some three weeks later, these edgelords are still harassing Peter by posting garbage like this and they're actively encouraging their followers to join in on it. And then the big one that many of us are familiar with. On March 2nd of this year, I could not believe my eyes, Behringer uploads the Kern cork sniffer video. A lot of people viewed this as racially and historically problematic, and I'll give Behringer the benefit of the doubt and say that they didn't intend it to be. But as a German company, you'd think that at some point along the line, someone would say, hey, this looks terrifyingly familiar. Don't f upload it. So this plunges the situation of the mainstream. Sites like Vice are covering it and being very critical of Behringer. So Uli Behringer posts this half-assed apology, which he deletes like a day later. This is where I personally hit the brakes and asked to send back the Behringer gear that I had on the review schedule for this channel. Because if I have to worry about being publicly shamed or even litigated for having a critical opinion about a company or a piece of gear, then you know what? Go pay a an influencer or a PR company. About a month ago on November 19th, Behringer asked their followers, what do you want out of an affordable MIDI controller? And all of the answers are pretty good. Polyphonic aftertouch, MPE support, 61 weighted keys, USB audio. Three days later, Behringer asks their followers some pretty blatant marketing questions. And the first one is a little bit weird. Do you trust product reviews of online synth magazines who are dependent on sponsorship and advertisement? What f***ing magazine is not dependent on advertisement? It's not like the government sends synth blog subsidies. Like the question just immediately gives them an opening to cast doubt on anybody who doesn't like their products or their behavior. Speaking of that, a few hours later, they announced the Behringer Swing, which is so similar to the Arturia Key Step that one could argue that they use the same molding plates. Neither of these things make noise, they're MIDI controllers, and this isn't a clone of a classic synth. I could go to the store right now and buy a Key Step. The Swing isn't making anything that much more accessible or affordable. The Key Step only costs $129, and the Swing is supposed to cost $99, but it won't have Arturia's MIDI Control Center, or it won't have Arturia's frequent firmware updates that add loads of features in pretty much all of their MIDI controllers. When you look at the pictures of the hardware, the swing does not add anything. Not a port, not a knob, nothing. Just like the cable tester, it appears to be the exact same product with a Behringer paint job over it. I don't think that this was a mistake or a competitive move. I think that Behringer crossed this line for a reason, a very hostile reason. Oh, and before you come up with theories about Behringer and Arturia licensing the same product and just branding it with their own name, that is absolutely not what happened. Both Arturia and the designer of the product confirmed that Behringer had licensed nothing and they didn't even know about it until the rest of us did. If I were to just take the ethics lobe out of my brain and throw it in the trash, I would still have absolutely no interest whatsoever in reviewing, buying, or even playing with the Behringer Swing because it offers absolutely nothing new. And the Behringer fans who are defending this, you cannot convince me that you are excited about this thing. Unless you have a YouTube channel full of videos of you just looking at bowls of rocks for hours in amazement, then I guess I would believe that by painting this thing black, you would be excited. So naturally, myself and a whole lot of other people had a lot of critical things to say about this announcement on Twitter, and Behringer shot back with this gem. Competition? The facts. 
What does that even mean? What are these facts that you're referring to? That gray market counterfeiting exists? Well, yeah, surprise, it does. And if you look up the reviews of the world e MIDI controller, you'll find out that half the people can't even get the fucking driver installed. Imagine speeding and getting pulled over and the cops like license and registration. And you're like, oh yeah, hang on. How's that look? Simon Magpie said something incredibly insightful in his video. He pointed out that this controversy and controversies like this actually punish Behringer's fans and biggest advocates by forcing them to reconcile with Behringer's shitty behavior. I can make an entire video on brand loyalty, and maybe I will, but people seem to tie their identities to things that they put a lot of money and time into. And this is what creates the PlayStation vs. Xbox, or the iPhone vs. Android, or the PC vs. Mac. Or you know what? If you want a really ridiculous example of this, go look at the video where I compare Ableton and FL Studio. People get really tribal. Our brains just behave this way and none of us are immune to it. And if you spend money on something like this and you spend a bunch of time with it and make a bunch of tunes with it, your identity gets connected to it. And then when Behringer posts something like Cork Sniffer, you feel like both of them are in the same package because of the brand, but in actuality, they're not. You can love this and hate this at the same time. Despite what Behringer may tell you, you or I are not members of the Music Tribe. Uli Behringer and his shareholders and investors are members of the Music Tribe, and we are the customers. But since we live in a capitalist society, the good news is, is that we are their boss because we have this and they want this. You know, one of the things that pains me as a musician is that Behringer has made some really really good gear. For example, the now discontinued BCF 2000 was dirt cheap. It had motorized faders. It's built like an absolute tank. I've brought it on countless tours and never had anything even resembling a problem. The BCR 2000 is an amazing rotor controller as well that I've featured previously on this channel when turning it into a sequencer. The DeepMind 12 is not only heavy and really well built, it's also a fully analog polysynth that sounds amazing. When I first got this, I was on tour and I locked myself in a hotel room for like two days playing with it. It's a really, really good synthesizer. And despite what people think about Behringer's hardware clones, making a clone of a 40 year old analog synthesizer takes a lot of research and development. The DeepMind is an affordable and competitive synthesizer. The Behringer Neutron is an affordable and competitive semi-modular synthesizer. The Behringer Swing, in my subjective personal opinion, is a counterfeit Arturia key step, and I would hedge a bet that most of my peers agree with me on this. And Uli, if you're watching this, you probably hate me because I know that you don't take criticism very well, but before you trademarked Peter Kern's name, before your company made the cork sniffer video, you said this. I'd like to donate a thousand synthesizers and I like to give them to kids. Kids which are less fortunate and privileged. By the way, if you didn't see anything, it's because YouTube's copyright system was abused to remove footage of Uli Behringer promising that he will donate 1,000 synthesizers to less fortunate children. Believe it or not, I did not hear about this generous offer of yours from randomly watching a video where Behringer congratulates itself for being around for 30 years, I was actually contacted by a lot of people because I used to run a nonprofit music school in South Chicago, and you asked for help on how to facilitate and organize your generous donation, and I actually had some ideas on how I could help and facilitate that. I spent many hours trying to contact you about this, and my wife and I have both emailed you to your email address. In fact, I know of other nonprofit organizations that have tried to contact you regarding this and they never heard anything and nobody ever heard about the thousand synthesizers going to underprivileged children again. And that is just so f***ing lame. So how about you follow through with that? Or how about you let us know why you couldn't follow through with that? Or you know what, if it's hard to facilitate that, I have an even better idea. How about instead of spending time and resources being edgy every single time somebody criticizes you, why don't you maybe man up and match the $21,000 that I've raised for charity this year? Me, a piss poor musician in the year of a pandemic. If you can match that donation to any humanitarian 
organization and prove it, I will remove this video and for one year, I will have your 2600 clone behind me in every single video that I make in my studio. Here's the thing, Behringer doesn't exactly make it hard for a video like this to get quite brutal. I could have brought you through other lawsuits. I could have talked about accusations of racism and sexism from past employees. But this video isn't about taking a piss on Behringer, believe it or not. This video is about pointing to the line. The Behringer swing is the line. The cork sniffer video is the line. The line is where Behringer starts hurting their loyal fan base and the industry that they thrive on. Behringer's customers, past or present, should not have to defend Behringer's ridiculous and hostile behavior. And they do defend it. They defend it in the comments of this very channel. If you're a Behringer fan, or if like me, you have accumulated a ton of Behringer gear over the years as a musician, before you crack your knuckles and call me a name in the comments, try to realize that I have you in mind when making this video. Fair competition gives you more features for less money across the board. Behringer's low price point makes companies have to justify their higher price tags with more features and more innovation, and that benefits all of us. But this, this, and this, this is all just egotistical bullshit that draws attention by pinning a small community against itself, and the only person to capitalize from it is this guy. And for that reason, unless Uli wants to pop his head out and explain or make good on his charitable pledges last year, I don't really want to give Behringer any more attention, and I'm not going to have anything to do with them on this channel in the future. And I urge my fellow YouTubers to consider doing the same. And hey, music retailers like Sweetwater, American Music Supply, Guitar Center, Musician's Friend, you already carry this product. And chances are that you have a pretty profitable relationship with Arturia. So maybe this would be a good time to draw that line and show these brands that keep you in business that you're a more loyal asset to them than Amazon is. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, nobody's talking to you, Lucy. So hey, I understand that my personality probably is the most entertaining when I'm being grumpy about something, but I actually don't really like making negative videos. I like contributing positivity to the world, even though it's a little difficult for me at times. Believe it or not, a few years ago, I actually intended on making a video defending Behringer against all of the criticism that they get online because their face value business model of making music gear more accessible to people who don't have money is something that I actually resonate with a whole lot. When Behringer announced the swing, I tweeted my opinion of it and that got a whole lot of traction and also a whole lot of discourse. And I suppose I'm making this video so you understand my point of view in its entirety. If you like this video, subscribe to my channel and click that little cowbell down there so you get a notification every time I upload something new. If there's anything you want me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments. If you want to support this channel, you can go to my Bandcamp. I got over 30 hours of music. Some people think it's swell. And if you want to see what I'm up to on a more frequent basis, you could follow me on social media. All of those links are in that link tree right there in the description. Okay, bye.